Okay. So, Jeremiah 29, verses 1 to 23 is where we're going to be. Hello, Hans. Hello, Hans. Good evening. Hello. So, Jeremiah 29, verses 1 through 23, we're going to see that Jeremiah wrote a letter to the exiles in Babylon. Now, Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. Uh, if you guys don't know it, it's, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. future How, and a hope. Yes, that too. <laughs> However, it is one of the most misquoted verses taken out of context. Pro proper Bible interpretation states that we must know what the passage meant for the original reader and then find the principle. Now this chapter is very prophetic. And in Bible prophecy, there is always a short-term prophecy and then a long-term prophecy. The short-term prophecy is about the exile's time in Babylon and their return to Jerusalem. The long-term prophecy has to do with the rapture of the church, the Great Tribulation, and our return with Christ. And the main point tonight is the Great Tribulation is for those who did not honor Christ. <clears throat> so, Melissa, I'll have you read Jeremiah 29.1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thank you. So what did Jeremiah send? A letter. A letter. Okay. Where did he send the letter from? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay. Where did he send the letter to? Babylon. To Babylon. Who in Babylon did he send the letter to? Elders, exiles, priests, prophets, and all the people. You got it. Now, there are three types of prophets in the Old Testament. Do you know what they are? Like, when we look at the prophetic books and the prophets in the Bible, do you know what the three types of prophets are? We have pre-exilic prophets, exilic prophets, and post-exilic prophets. So this means prophets before the exile, prophets in the exile, and prophets after the exile. Okay? So which of these prophets would have had access to this letter? Pre, exilic, or post-exilic? Exilic. Exilic. Okay, great. Now, the prophets that went into exile, do you know the two biblical prophets that went into exile? Ezekiel and Daniel. They went into exile. Okay. Um, Stacy, Jeremiah 29 2, please. This was after this was after King Jeconia and the Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. Thank you. So what did Jeremiah when sorry, when did Jeremiah send the letter? It was after King Jeconia yeah. and the Queen and the eunuchs and the officials of Judah and Jerusalem 
departed, or, and craftsmen and metal workers all departed from Jerusalem. Okay. So, <clears throat> I thought I'd do a little bit of investigation. I thought, you know what, when did King Jeconiah, when did he get deported? Because they all got deported at once. And they would have been sent out to Babylon on March 15th, 597 B.C. Now this would have been, when on the Hebrew calendar, this would have been the 8th of Nisan. Do you guys know what happens in Nisan? The Passover. And the Passover happens on the 14th of Nisan. Six days. So this letter, uh, sorry, so they got sent out six days before the Passover. So this letter could very well have been written on or about the time of the Passover which is Nisan 14. Now, what's so important about the Passover? What does that foreshadow? Well, the Passover was when uh, the angel came yeah. and uh, went on the war post. Yeah. And so he passed over mm -hmm. those houses. So it foreshadows redemption of Christ, I guess. Yes, the crucifixion of Christ. Really interesting that this could have been written on that time, or at least in that season. Really interesting. Jeremiah 29.3, please write. <clears throat> the letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shephan, and Jermira, the son of Elika, King Jedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying... Okay. <clears throat> so, who took this letter to Babylon? Yeah, uh, Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah. Hilkiah. Yeah, so Gem Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah. Those are some neat names. Do any of those names ring a bell? Hilkiah? Mm. Hilkiah rings a bell. How about the other one? Shaphan ring a bell? Helen. Some of them are not talking here. Okay. Helen, can you read 2 Kings 22, 8 to 13, please? 2 Kings 22, yeah. 8 to 13. Eight to yeah, 8 to 13. High priest said to Shepha, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shepha, who was who had sorry, who read it. Then Shepha, the secretary, went to the king and reported it to him. Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord, and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors of the temple. Then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest has come, has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the swords of the book, oops, sorry, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah, the priest, a high, sorry. A high cam. Thank you. A high cam. King of Shaphan, or son of Shaphan, Abkor, son of Micaiah, Shaphan, the secretary of Isaiah, the king's attendant. 
Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns, burns against us, because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written Thank you. there according to us. Thank you. So who found the book of the law? Hilkiah. Hilkiah, the high priest. Who did Hilkiah give the book of the law to? Shaphan. What did Shaphan do? He read the book of the law. Who did Shaphan take the book of the law to? King Josiah. What did King Josiah do after the book of the law was read to him? Tore his clothes. Tore his clothes. Why did he tear his clothes? Because of the way they were acting, he knew he was on his road to condemnation. That's right. Do you know do you remember what God said to Josiah after this? We didn't read it. Do you remember what he said? Because Josiah was the last godly king. If you remember, it was the sin, the sin of King Manasseh, the king before him, where God said, I'm done with you all. Didn't he say that uh, if everyone repented, that he would take away his wrath? Or not? Uh, he would, he would put a stay wrath. on his wrath during Josiah's reign, but they were still going to be destroyed. Okay, so let's go back to Jeremiah 29, 3. Please, Darcy. 29, 3? Yes, sir. The letter was sent by the hand and of Elasar, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Thank you. So who was Gemariah's dad? Hilkiah. Hilkiah! Who else had a father? Who else had Hilkiah as a father? Shepha? No. Hilkiah Jeremiah's father. That's right! So this is also Jeremiah's brother. Okay. Who had Shaphan as a dad? Or Shaphan as a dad? Elasa. Elasa. Now, what did Hilkiah do in 2 Kings? What's he noted for? You read it tonight. Finding the book of the law. And he gave it to Shaphan. What did Shaphan do with it? He read it, read it. to the king. Read it to the king. Do you see what's happened here? God tasked these two men's children with the handling of one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. Because you honored my word, the son of Hilkiah is writing this, the other son of Hilkiah and the son of Shaphan are taking it. Our, our obedience to God just doesn't matter for us. It matters for our children. When our children, okay, 
here's something. You, you guys have probably seen it also. A lot of you may have grown up in church and you thought, all I see is religion. I don't need this. I'll go somewhere else. Have you guys been there? You have? Do we know people like that? Why? Because they've never seen God work. All they know is go there on Sunday, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, sing from a book, try not to yawn, pretend you know what the preacher's talking about, congratulate him on a great sermon, you don't know what he said, go home, and then, you know, next Friday night, go out and party, go out and party Saturday night, and go back to church on Sunday with your, with your folks. And it... And it's just religion. It's just ritual. But what did Jeremiah, Gemariah, and Elasa see? They saw their fathers obeying God and being used by God. It wasn't empty religion. These two men, Hilkiah and Shaphan, because of their obedience, saved that generation from the wrath of God. Can you imagine being their children and saying, no, nah, God's just a myth. It's just ritual. I, I'll go on Christmas. I'll go on Easter. That would never happen when you see God work. It would never happen if you saw God work. And why is the church dead in North America? Because it's religion. It's just ritual. We'll sing our songs. We'll listen to the preacher. As long as he says nice things about me, I'm fine. As long as he doesn't hurt my feelings, I'm fine. We'll give her money, and then we'll go home. And we'll do it again next Sunday. Jeremiah 29, 4, please, Jane. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carry into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thank you. So who is speaking in the letter? The Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. You remember from two weeks ago? That's also my Redeemer. The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Who is being spoken to? The exiles. The exiles that God carried into exile. What future event does the exile represent? The rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. Greg, can you read uh, 29.5, please? Sure. Build houses and settle down plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Thank you. So what were they supposed to do while they're in exile? They're going to be there for a while. You're going to be there for a while, so what are you going to do? Get coffee house. and grow food. Yeah, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, and eat, eat from them. Why would God tell them to do that? They're going to be here a while. Not going to be a short time. Not going to be a short time. Uh, Melissa, 29.6, please. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Okay. So why were they to take husbands and wives for their children? According to what it says, why? Multiply. Multiply. Because it wasn't a lot of people that went into Exile. And after seven years, there'd be none left if you didn't multiply. That's right. There'd be none to come back. 
if you want to look at uh, something really neat, this is just impromptu. But let's look at how many people actually went into exile. It's at the end of Jeremiah. Uh, I think it's Jeremiah 50. No, it's 52. Um, 52, 30. Well, let's go 28. This is, it's, it's the last chapter of Jeremiah. Last page. This is the number of people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive in the seventh year. 3,023 Judeans in the 18th year, because there's three deportations, right? In the 18th year uh, of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem 832 persons. In the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried away captive of Judeans 745 persons. All the persons were 4,600. Out of how many people in Israel? 4,600. That's it. Now, keep your finger there, or go back to 29, put your finger there, and then go to <clears throat> Ezra chapter 1. Because Ezra brings them back. Ezra chapter 2. And I wrote it down. Um, I did all the math a long time ago. The total amount of people was 49,697. That is a 1,080% growth. More people came back than went, went in. 1,080%. Anyway, that was impromptu. Um, 29-7, whose turn is it? Stacy. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray for the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Okay, so what two things were they supposed to do in Babylon? Seek the welfare of, of the, the city. Yeah. And uh, pray to the Lord on its behalf. So do good to the city and pray for the city. Why were they to pray for and seek the welfare of the city according to this verse? Why does it then you will find your welfare. Look, if you're going to treat the city like crap, they're going to treat you like crap. You bless them, they'll end up blessing you. Okay. Uh, Ray, we're going to read 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, please. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispension in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Great. Yours says pilgrims. Does anyone else say something else? Elect to the elect exiles. Mine says foreigners. Foreigners, yeah. To the exiles. Because they were kicked out also. They were kicked out of Rome. All the Jews and the Christian Jews were kicked out of Rome somewhere between 40 and 50 A.D. Um, 
Helen, 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, please. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly, worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. And 12, please. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. So why are we to keep our conduct honorable among the Gentiles as we are exiles? So that when they speak against you, they'll see your good deeds. That's and glorify right. God. And glorify God. How we live matters. Mm -hmm. You can't live like the devil six days a week and go to church Sunday and exp expect God to bless you. And look, the whole world can see through that. How many times have I heard that? So you just pray that prayer, Jesus forgive me, and Jesus is my Lord now, and you can sin all week long and you're just forgiven. I don't want a God like that. How many times have you been told that? Now, this is just a side note. If you want the book, I'll, I'll give it to you again. But there's an excellent book that I've listened to twice this year called Evangelism as Exiles by Elliot Clark. I highly recommend it. Because... Let's face it, we're living in Babylon. We are not in a Christian nation. How do we live? According to Jeremiah 29 and 1 Peter. It's really important to know. You've made a friend. You've made a friend for life. <laughs> Okay, uh, Jane twenty, uh, Jeremiah twenty nine eight, please. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says: Do not let the prophets and the diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. Okay, no, that's good. That's good. How does God define himself here? God of Israel, God of Israel, Lord of hosts. Okay. Who is not to deceive them? Okay, so we know that we have two solid prophets there. We have Ezekiel and Daniel. But we got all these other ones popping up, thinking that there's somebody. What are they not to listen to? Oh, sorry, who is not to deceive them? Prophets, diviners who are in your midst. Yeah, that's right. What are they not to listen to? Your dreams. The dreams that they dream. Meaning, go back to the Word. Go back to the Word. All those people out there saying, God sent me word in a dream. Yeah. Over and over, you see it all the time. Yeah. Okay. Jeremiah 29, 9. Please, Greg. They are prophets prophesizing lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Okay. What are they prophesying? Lies. 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 Whose name are they prophesying the lie in? The Lord's name. 
Remember, Jesus Christ, his name means God is salvation, the chosen one. Saying you're, you're prophesying that I'm salvation and you're not prophesying the right salvation. Um, Galatians 1 has something to say about that. So if it's lies, it's from the Father of lies. That's right. So what did, uh, what did the Lord not do? Didn't send them. Didn't send them. Okay. Melissa, 29.10, please. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Okay. When will the Lord visit them? Years are completed. When 70 years are completed, what will the Lord fulfill to them? His promise. His promise. And what was his promise? Bring them back. Bring them back to this place. Okay. Stacy, Daniel 9, 1 to 3, please. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. <laughs> yeah. One to three. Oh. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent, a Mead, me, me, yeah. who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Je Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Verse 3. Oh. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and please and please for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes thank you was daniel a prophet yeah yeah, yeah. what did he perceive how many years need to go by before yeah well he he did. He knew that, but what did he actually perceive about that? Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem to be able to had to lie desolate for the next seventy years. Yeah, De desolations had to happen. So destruction. What else did he perceive? It's something about the seventy years. It was, it was the end of the desolations of Jerusalem. Yeah. So the seventy years was almost up. How did he perceive this? By prayer. No, that was his response. Oh, How did he? He, he, read he read Jeremiah 29. Mm -hmm. Was Daniel relying on a dream or a vision? No. no. He was relying on the word of God. Okay, uh, whose turn is it? Uh, Ray, Romans one sixteen, please. <clears throat> for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first, and also for the Greek. 
So who does salvation come to first? The Jew. The Jew. Who does salvation come to second? The Greek or the Gentile. Helen, Romans 2 9, please. There will be affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the first to the Jew and also to the to the Greek. Okay, so who gets tribulation first? The Jew. The Jew. Who gets tribulation second? The Gentile. Darcy, Jeremiah 27, verse 8, please. First, if you go back to Romans 1, yeah. it says salvation is for the Jew mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. and then the Gentile. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the tribulation, the Jews go through the tribulation, but yet the rapture is before that. So really, mm -hmm. the... Gentile well, okay, so the tribulation goes for the whole world. I'm sorry, who's the Greek? It goes through the whole world. Yeah, the Jew goes through it, but so does the whole world. In this one with Nebuchadnezzar, it's the Jews. Jew first, then the world. Yeah. Uh, Jeremiah 27, 8, please. Okay. But if any nation or kingdom will not serve this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, I will punish that nation with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence, declares the Lord, until I have consumed it by his hand. So how will people die who do not go to Babylon? With sword, famine, and plague. Sword, famine, and pestilence, or plague. Uh, Jane, Jeremiah 21, 8 to 10, please. Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says. See, I am setting before you the way of life, the way of death. Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine, and plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians will be besieged. You will live. He will escape with his life. So how will people die? Famine, pestilence, plague. And sword. Yeah. Who will live? Surrender. Go to Babylon. Surrender and go to Babylon. Greg, Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speak to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what you must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit. There before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelia, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold in their heads. Two, six, please. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbling, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. There are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, there were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes. You can... Yeah, that, that, that's good. That's, that's good. So what was John told to do? Come up here. 
where did he go to? The throne room of God. What was burning in verse 5? Seven torches which fire. Seven torches. Another translation might say candlesticks. Another one might say lampstands. Now, according to Revelation 1.20, what are the lampstands? The churches. The churches. The seven churches. Okay. Melissa, read, read Revelation 6, verses 7 and 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. So what seal was opened? The fourth. The fourth. How many people on the earth died? A fourth. A fourth. Okay. How many people on earth right now? Eight billion. Eight billion. How many people died when this fourth seal opened up? Two billion people. Just to put it this way, that is 20 times more people that died in World War II. You realize we could be within a matter of months of this. I don't go through the home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Months to maybe a couple years. That's how close we are to this. John Barnett, you shared this. If you guys don't know who John Barnett is, John Barnett runs Discover the Bible Ministries. John Barnett used to teach at Master Seminary. John Barnett was on staff with John MacArthur. John Barnett is the major contributing author to the commentary for the book of Revelation in the John MacArthur Study Bible. That one right there. John MacArthur has his Ph.D. in the book of Revelation. He's got more degrees in uh, Bible history than what's on the thermometer. That's right. Yeah. And do you know what he said in, at, at the beginning of October? More end times prophecy has been fulfilled in the last 30 days than in the last 20 years combined. Wow. He does a monthly update. He does. Like, guys, you don't understand. We are super close to the rapture. I can't give you a date. He says when he reads the headlines in the news, it's like he's reading his Bible. Yeah. This is how close we're at. So... We are on the brink of World War III right now. As Jan Markell puts it, we're just waiting for the Mr. Fix-It to show up, the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. But the Antichrist shows up just after the rapture. You see what the U.S. did last night in the evening? Go ahead. Well, they went with the stealth bomber. It's the only one that can carry these bombs. And uh, these bombs will penetrate something like 125 feet or something into the ground before they explode. Mm -hmm. Bunker busters, yeah. Yeah. And they, they got a lot of their ammunition and stuff that they're storing in Yemen. And it was kind of a, an example as to show Iran what they can do with their nuclear stuff because they think it's all safe because it's underground. Mm. And they're saying, no, it's not safe because these these uh, bombs will penetrate it. And the stealth bomber now is in that area. They're, they're uh, housing it in uh, India. That's interesting. So now, when we go back to Revelation 6, 7, and 8, we saw that 2 billion people are going to die just when that fourth seal is open. We still have three more seals to go. 
How did they die? Pestilence, sword, sword and famine. Gee, doesn't that sound familiar? The trifecta. <laughs> now, according to what we've read in Revelation, where's the church at this point? It's gone. It's gone. We're where? Raptured. We're raptured. God says, come up here. And we're there. The church isn't here for this. Whose turn is it? Stacy, Revelation 19, 11 to 14, please. Nineteen. Eleven. Eleven to fourteen. Nineteen, eleven to fourteen. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name of which of which he is called is the word of God. How far? Uh, to 14. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him in, on white horses. So who is returning with Jesus? The church. It says the armies of heaven. Mm -hmm. You're getting ahead of me there, Ray. You're right, but you're getting ahead of me. Well, it's also the angels. How were they dressed? Fine linen, white and pure. Yes. So who are these people? Church. The, yes, those who are redeemed by the Lord. It is the church. When they return, who is reigning? Christ's kingdom or man's kingdom? Christ. Christ's kingdom. Let's go back to 29.10, Ray. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 29.10. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord, <coughs> after 70 years are accomplished or completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform a good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. Thank you. When will Jesus when will Jesus visit them? When the 70 years are done. When the 70 years are done. Who went through the worst time in Israel's history? Those who stayed in Jerusalem or those who went to Babylon? Those who stayed in Jerusalem. Those who stayed in Jerusalem. What does the 70 years in Babylon represent? The period of the tribulation. Yeah, but when you're in Babylon, are you in the tribulation or are you in somewhere else? No, you're, you're, raptured. you're raptured. I'm talking about the people that were in Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. So the people in Babylon, rapture. Take zero off 70, what do you got? Seven. God can't make it any more clear. When Israel came back after 70 years, were they their own so were, were they under their own sovereign reign or under the reign of another nation? The reign of another nation. The reign of another nation. <coughs> which at that time would have been Medo-Persia. When we come back from the rapture, do we rule ourselves or do we rule with Christ? Now that we've got all this under our belt, we can now see how the Western Church has been mishandling Jeremiah 29, 11. Whose turn is it? 
your turn, 29.11. Oh, let's, I want you to read in context, Jeremiah 29.10 to 11, please. For this is what the Lord says. When 70 years for Babylon are up, are complete, I will attend to you and confirm my promise concerning you to restore to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. When will God promise to bring them back? After 70 years. What does God know? His plans. His plans for? Their future. What people? The exiles. The, the exiles. The Israelites. Yes, the exiles. Does Israel... Okay, what are his plans? To have them prosper. Welfare. Yeah. Welfare, prosper, no harm. Okay, does Israel follow Jesus Christ right now? No. No. When... Will Israel get saved according to the Bible? And there is only a third of them left in Jerusalem. And we look up and cry for his help. Now, at what point in the future is that? It's at the end of the tribulation. End of the great tribulation. The battle of Armageddon. When does Jesus return? At the end of the Great Tribulation. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Who is he talking to? Exiles or people who stayed? Exiles. When do exiles come back? At the end. At the beginning of the millennium. Do you see how the Western church has bastardized this? God has become your own pocket genie. God has plans for you and he will bless you and not harm you and give you plans for hope and a future. And that's not what it's saying at all. It's saying, when you come back with me from the rapture, these are my plans. I'm going to give you a hope and a future. I think when you read the Bible, you have to understand who it's being written to. Because mm -hmm. It's written to the Jews, mm -hmm. it's written to the Gentiles, and it's written to the church. Mm -hmm. So you have to know what, who it's speaking to. That's right. And so now that's speaking to people in exile, the people who are being saved from the greatest tribulation the Jews have ever seen. We know we can take that principle now. That's what hermeneutics is. You take the principle, you find out who, it, who it's talking to. The original readers, original audience... And then you find the principle and you apply it. And the principle is to those who are raptured out of tribulation. <coughs> so now when you drive into Bow Island and you see that big thing, Jeremiah 29, 11, do you just want to puke now? Have you talked to them? Do they do, do you know what they're saying about that? Um, I think that's the Christian school. It is. Yeah. Let me ask you. For a bunch of you, how long have you been Christians? August nineteenth, two thousand five. Two thousand five. Now that we've broken this down and seen this, have you? I'm not saying that I have 
excellent teaching skills. I'm just saying, let's just break it down. Have you guys ever heard it taught like this? No. No. Why? Because the Western church really doesn't even know Scripture. They just want to hear what makes them happy. Mm-hmm. That's right. Like, we got friends that would buy the Bible bookmarks. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, we covered that last night in Bible study. And they're like, that doesn't mean what I thought it means. You're right. Wait until you hear Jeremiah 29, 11, I, I said to him. <laughs> and what's happened is the church has commercialized the Word of God and they have bastardized it. I remember when I got got on staff at the church in Texas. I was so excited. This is Bible Belt. People are going to know the Bible. We're going to have deep theological discussions. In the Bible Belt, guess what? Even the pastors don't know what it says. And then I come back here, and I remember being so mad, like yelling angry. How can you live like this? You have churches on every street corner and you guys don't even know what the Word of God says. And guess what? It's no different in Canada. And you want to know why Canada and the United States are in the sewer? Because we've bastardized the Word of God. We've taken little sound bites, if you will, out of the Bible, and we've claimed them for promises that don't mean what you think it means. Well, they're saying that it's promised to everybody. Really? It's is not... that is that what it says here? No, but that's yeah. what yeah. all the other people That's say. right. Not, not, what, not what it really says. No, it, exactly. <laughs> So now, when you look at this, how many churches are actually preaching a lie? Some don't even realize it. Exactly. Now, according to 2 Thessalonians, what comes right before the rapture? The great apostasy, the great falling away. Most churches don't even know they're bastardizing the Word of God. I wrote this down for last sermon on Sunday. I'll try to find it here. What did we do? It's 28, so we'll be in here. Acts 17. Richard Halverson, chaplain to the U.S. Senate, said this in 2009. In the beginning, the church was a fellowship of men and women centering on the living Christ. Then the church moved to Greece when it became a philosophy. Then it moved to Rome where it became an institution. Next, it moved to Europe, where it became a culture. And finally, it moved to America, where it became an enterprise. Let's keep on going. Jeremiah 29, 12. Whose turn is it? Darcy. Darcy, 29, 12, please. Then you will call upon me, and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. What will happen after 70 years, or and what will happen 
right after the Great Tribulation. To call upon the Lord in praise. Yes. And God will hear them. What happens at the end of the Great Tribulation? They finally seek Jesus and they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's when they find him. Jeremiah 29, 13, please. Jane. You will seek me and find me when, when you seek me with all your heart. Thank you. When will Jesus, when will the Jews find God? How are they going to look for them? For him? Using all their heart. All their heart. Remember what Jesus says in John 5? You study the scriptures, thinking in them is eternal life. But it's them that point to me, and you refuse to come to me to have eternal life. You're not seeking me. You're seeking Bible jeopardy. Twenty nine fourteen, please, Melissa. Uh, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Okay, thank you. What will the Lord do when they find him? And gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you. That's right. Now, are all their fortunes restored? Do they have the temple? Do they have the sea? You're talking about now? Yeah, oh. they don't. No. Do they have the wealth of Solomon? No. But... The process is there, isn't it, right now? It's not going to happen until the end, fully happen until the end of the Great Tribulation. Now, did God bring them back? Yes, we saw that in uh, uh, Ezra tonight. But did he restore their fortunes? No. They weren't even their own nation until 1948 again. But over recent years, they really uh, prospered. They very they've prospered. But are they seeking Jesus? No. no. Some are. Some are, but he's talking to all the exiles. Okay, let's keep on reading. Twenty nine fifteen to sixteen, please, Stacy. <clears throat> Because you have said, the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. Thus says the Lord, concerning the king who sits on the throne of David, and concerning all the people who dwell in this city, your kinsmen who did not go out with you into exile. Thank you. Who did the Lord, who is the Lord talking to? People who did not, what? Who exile. Didn't, so the people that stayed in the city. Yeah. Now he's talking to the people that staying in the city and did not go to exile. Okay. Jeremiah 29, 17, please. All right. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send on them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence. And will make them with rotten figs that cannot be eaten. Thank you. They are so bad. Yes. What is the Lord sending on those who did not go to Babylon? Sword, Sword famine, famine, and pestilence. Yes. Oh, gee. <laughs> God can't make it more clear, can he? Is this the wrath of God or the tribulation from Satan? 
How do we know, Ray? Because he said he so. Says, yeah, I'm know. sending it, he says. Yeah. Huh. Is, this, is the Great Tribulation going to be worse than this? Oh, yes! The book of Daniel says it will be the worst time in human history. If you were part, I think Ray and uh, Stacy, I think you were part of our Daniel study. Do you remember what happened to Daniel when he saw the vision of the Great Tribulation? It affected him so badly he was in bed sick for a month. This is going to be bad. And that's right. That's right. And we look at where we're at in the month of September. More end times Bible prophecy has been fulfilled than the last 20 years combined. Gee, how close are we to this? Closer than we realize. Yeah. Is the Great Tribulation the wrath of God or tribulation from Satan? It's the wrath of God. 2918, please. I will, oh, sorry. <laughs> I will pursue them with sword, famine, and plague. I will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, a curse and desolation, an object of scorn and disgrace among all the nations where I have banished them. What will God pursue them with? Oh, oh my goodness. What will he make them become? Trouble among the kingdoms of the earth to be cursed. A horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, a curse, yes. What will they to be? A curse, a terror, a hissing, and a reproach. The people that did not go in the rapture, the people that did not go to Babylon, they become a curse, a terror, a hissing, a reproach. All of Judah who did not get quote-unquote raptured will become the bloody, gory terror of an example to the rest of the world of what will happen to them in the real Great Tribulation. Gee, I wonder why the Western Church doesn't teach this. They're scaring people. Oh, too bad. The truth is here. Yeah. 29.19, please. Because they did not pay attention to my words, declares the Lord, that I persistently sent to you by my servants, the prophets. But you would not listen, declares the Lord. Thank you. Why would God do this? Why would God pursue them with sword, famine, famine and pestilence? And they didn't pay attention. How did God send his word to them? Through his prophets. Okay. Who are the quote-unquote prophets today? The church. Okay. They have been people that have got very upset with me. 
because I quote Matthew 4, 19. Jesus makes a promise. And that promise is, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And people understand it as, if I'm not out in the park preaching to strangers, I'm not saved. That's not what the Bible says. Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. If you jump into the pool, you're going to get wet. Does that make sense? That's a promise. If you're really following Jesus, He makes you a fisher of men. What is the most important function of the church? Evangelism. Telling people, you're on the highway to hell. If you think the great tribulation is going to be bad, hell's going to be worse. I'm 47 years old. Could you imagine being trapped in a burning building where you can feel everything and never die for 47 years? And then you realize, I have 97 trillion years to go, and then it starts all over again. I'm never getting out of here. And we look at the church today. And how many churches are teaching people teaching their disciples how to follow Jesus. Especially when they come to me and say, you mean in order for me to be saved, I've got to share the gospel? You've got it backwards. The churches put evangelism at the very bottom and they might have evangelistic events once or twice a year, a VBS and a Christmas program. Flee. Flee the city of destruction. Why would God do this? They did not pay attention to his words. How did God sound his word? Persistently through the prophets. Who are the prophets today? The church. What does the church pre preach? Repent and turn to Jesus to escape the wrath of God. And all we hear is, God has a plan for your life. He sure does. And most of you are going to hell. Do most churches in the West do this? Or do they mishandle Jeremiah 29.11? You show me a church that is growing by conversion growth only or mostly, and I will show you a church that's following Jesus. If you have a church that is growing by transfer growth, run. They're just going there because they like the pastor. If your church isn't growing by conversion growth, 
you're in the wrong church. Run. Were the prophets, were the false prophets preaching peace and blessing or turn from God's wrath? The false prophets, were they preaching peace and blessing or turn from God's wrath? Peace and blessing. Is most of the church in North America true or false? Read Jeremiah 29, 20 to 21. Whose turn is it? Okay. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all you exiles who have sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says about Ahab, son of... Kaloat. <laughs> Brother K. <laughs> and Zedadiah, son of Masachiah, who are prophesying, prophesying lies to you in my name. I will hand them over to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will put them to death before your very eyes. Thank you. Who was to hear the word of the Lord? All the exiles. All the exiles. What were these two people doing, these two kings doing? Prophesying what? Lies. A lie in God's name. Mm -hmm. What would God do about this? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar will kill them. Jeremiah 29, 22, please. Because of them, all the exiles from Judea who are in Babylon will use this curse. <coughs> the Lord treat you like Ahab, Zechariah, and Ahab, <coughs> whom the king of Babylon burned in the fire. Thank you. <coughs> what will happen because of them? This curse shall be used by all exiles from Judah and Babylon. Okay. Growing up, if someone in my family wanted to call say what I did was something like really dumb or really stupid. <coughs> what they call me? Don't be a Nimrod. Have you guys ever heard that? Yeah. But who was Nimrod? The very first Antichrist. The, the tower builder. Yeah. But so now these guys don't be an Ahab. That, that's what they're saying. Don't be an Ahab. Their names will be turned into a curse. What will the curse be? <coughs> the Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. You know, he just didn't cut off their heads. What will happen... Before I get to there, he didn't just cut off their heads. He roasted them in the fire. These false prophets who are supposed to be part of God's people... <laughs> God has a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> Burn in hell! That's what he's saying. Sorry, <laughs> didn't mean to scare you. <laughs> Poor Nitro. <laughs> Poor Nitro? <laughs> <laughs> Whose closet are you in? <laughs> <laughs> what will happen... To all these false churches 
that preach peace and blessing instead of telling people to turn from the wrath of God. They're roasting in the fire. They're roasting in the fire. They're not teaching people how to follow Jesus. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You know, if Peter and Andrew, who Jesus was talking to, were firefighters, he'd say, follow me, and I'll help you rescue people from burning buildings. Whose turn is it? Second Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, please. So, uh, General Electric Power Company, 1, 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, what? Uh, 2, 3, and 4. Sorry, I'm not bored. I'm suddenly very tired. Yeah. <laughs> Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be a God, to be God. So who is this man of lawlessness? The Antichrist. The Antichrist. What must happen before he comes? He must be revealed. Not before that. The rebellion. The rebellion, also known as the great falling away or the great apostasy. Now that we've looked and seen how many churches here in the West are false, are we here now in this great falling away, in this rebellion? We're darn close. So would you say all these churches, churches that are preaching light, love, laughter, all of that cookie-cutter stuff, Put them on a skewer. That's, that's the apostasy. That's the apostasy. People think that the apostasy is rainbow flags. Yes, it is. But it's also, don't teach the deep stuff because people won't understand it. It's scary. It, God loving. Yeah, goodness. well, God... <laughs> The God of the New Testament is love and grace, and the God of the Old Testament is wrath. Really? He hasn't changed. He has not changed. But you know, like, even years ago, churches weren't teaching it properly. No. Like, I... Like, really... When you think about it, none of them ever have. So. Well, they used to. They used to. But when you started, when, when pastors stopped being a pastor because of the calling and the gift, and became a pastor because I know pastors in the States that are good friends of mine, very solid. They're making a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Okay. But they have the degrees to show it also. But there's others. They realize, I can turn this into a business. I can turn this into a tax-exempt business. And I can build my kingdom. And if I just go a little light, we, we don't need to preach the wrath of God. Let's just preach the good side, the side that we like of God. Like Rick Warren. 
we don't we don't preach the anger of God. We just preach a light salvation message. Really? Saddleback Community Church. Running what? 50, 60,000 people? There's some pretty solid ones out there, though. Oh, there are solid ones, man. Like Tom MacArthur and yeah. Maverick. And yeah, there are solid ones. And... Yeah. But yeah, for the... those people are here. <laughs> <laughs> No, but they're huge congregations, and they're they're quite solid in their teaching. Hundred percent, a hundred percent. I didn't say all; I said most. Twenty nine, twenty three. Please turn this up. <laughs> because they have done an outrageous thing in Israel they have committed adultery with their neighbors wives and they have spoken in my name lying words that I did not command them I am the one who knows and I am witness declares the Lord what have they done it was bad. They committed adultery. And they lied in God's name. Have you noticed how many pastors have been disqualified from the ministry lately? Yeah. They're just calling out Paul's name. Including, including the dean of the doctorate program at Master Seminary. Dr. Steve Lawson. Tony Evans. Tony Evans, too? Tony Evans, like two months ago, man. And who's Tony Evans? Uh, he's a black preacher from Dallas. Yeah. You know why? This, this is my, my thinking. They're so used to putting on the show. They're so used to putting on the show. This is why I'm so excited about you guys going through experiencing God. Knowing and doing the will of God. Theology is good. But if you're turning the Bible into a VCR manual, no one's going to want that God. Because that God is boring. You break it down. You look at the syntax. You look at the context. You, there's no application. Okay, great. We got it. God's triune. Great. He's immutable. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, justification, sanctification, glorification, fantastic. How do I follow Jesus? How do I live a life in following Jesus? Who's teaching that? You. Oh, I think it's more than just me. <laughs> but, but there's very few. People we know. Yeah. I'm saying this because this is being recorded. And it's going on YouTube. If your pastor is not teaching you how to follow Jesus, proven by what Jesus says the fruit is, that Jesus will make you a fisher of men, it's time to leave. It's time to leave. Because you will be, by proxy, you will get the same condemnation. How close are we to seeing the Antichrist? When we look at what we just looked at, how close are we to seeing the Antichrist? 
Well, the, the world, I mean. Very close. We are on the brink of World War III. Like, put it this way. Who would have thought that we could develop technology to target pagers and CB radios of terrorists to blow up in their pockets. Israel is at war on seven fronts right now. And you want to hear from people and say, we're this close? Oh, well, you never know the day or the hour. No, you don't, but you know the season. And people that say, you know, you never know the day or the hour. You know what? You're not following Jesus, man. You're not. Because Jesus says, when you see these things, look up, your redemption draws near. They can only be six months in because Hamas is finished. Hamas is done. They got Sinar today. Yeah, Sinar was destroyed this morning. Was well, actually, they found out he was killed yesterday, but they confirmed yeah. it today. So how? So if we are extremely close to the Great Tribulation, how close are we to the Rapture? Even closer. Even closer. Tonight. <laughs> Could be. Could be. This brings us to our conclusion. Number one. God uses godly families. God uses families that point people back to Him. Look at Hilkiah and Shaphan. God uses them. The Babylonian exile foreshadows the rapture. I think we saw that extremely clearly tonight. Number three. As believers, we need to be a blessing to our communities. Number four, when we seek to bless our communities, we will end up being blessed. Number five, we follow the word of God, not dreams and visions. Number six, both blessings and curses come first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Number seven. The people who did not go to Babylon died the same way as people will die in the Great Tribulation. Number eight. The vast majority of churches quote Jeremiah 29 and 11 grossly out of context. Jeremiah 29 11 is not for my personal blessing, but it's the promise for Israel that they, like us, will reign with Christ in the millennium. And number 10, it's not until God's people start seeking Jesus with their whole hearts that they will find him. We need to dump empty religion and live with and for Jesus. Darcy, can you pray for us?